Peace everyone, Unmask Art here, and welcome back to another paint and chat. I'm just going to be working on this simple uh, still life and oil paint. I just took this reference photo a little bit ago, so this is for my own my own uh, reference. everyone had a good week. Hey there, Yargo. I'm going to be flipping this around quite a bit today, so bear with me. How are you doing? If you guys have any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them. This project here is part of the Evolve program. I have more information on that in the description. If you want to check it out for yourself. I'm currently in block two of that program. And this is my 21st oil painting in that program. And it's a lot of fun. I've been enjoying it. Yeah, I'll paint the whole thing I'm going to paint the whole thing today. Hey there, Lena. Good to see you. So the first first steps is to just block everything in. And really this is what takes the most time is just getting the canvas covered. I'm using canvas paper for this painting.
Anyone have some fun projects that they're working on? Awfully quiet in chat. I'm not too talkative myself. Maybe I should change the title from just painting. <laughs> How do I draw such perfect lines with a paintbrush? Um, do you mean my edges here? The best way to do it, to get these clean edges, well, first off, I'm using a filbert brush. And so imagine this is the line that you wanna get to, right? That's the line that you wanna work up to. You always want to point your brush towards the edge. So if this is the edge I'm trying to make, I'm going to point my brush that direction. I'm going to slowly work the paint towards that edge. And I'll just keep doing it until the canvas is filled. And that's how you get those clean edges. You can see that the, the other side is jaggedy and if, for instance, again, if I have this line and I try to paint up to it, but I try to do it from this side, it is next to impossible. It's very, very difficult to do. And you can see I went over it right there. So you never want to paint the opposite direction your paintbrush is facing to get those clean lines. And that's... Uh, that's really all you got to do. This line here doesn't really matter that much because it's a gradient anyway. This line here, I will blend that out so I'm not too concerned about being precise with that, with that edge there. But I do want to make sure I get the canvas covered. Absolutely, Sarah. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, so painting painting inside the line, getting those clean edges, you don't want to try to do it in one motion. Doing it in one motion, it's hard to see, but there's still edges, there's still bumps and stuff. You want to sort of scrub the paint real gently. Maybe I can see if my camera can focus that. There. there we go. So if I try to do this in one motion, you go slow enough, you can get pretty close. But you see how there's still those missing gaps because of the texture of the canvas? You just have to go through and very gently I'm not like pressing the brush into the canvas or anything just work that edge to smooth it out and you know no matter how sharp I try to get these lines the texture of the canvas is going to prevent it from being like razor blade sharp or anything
another good thing to think about when you're trying to get those edges is the type of brush that you're using. I, I generally always use filbert brush because it's so versatile because you have that and then you also have the blade if you turn the brush sideways you can get really thin so you have the more vertical you are you can get pretty pretty clean lines pretty clean edges that way to do uh, small corners in those types of areas Yeah, you can pretty much do just about everything with just a single filbert brush. You can get really small details and you can blend things out pretty decently as well if you have good brush control. Utilizing the shape of your brush is what it's all about. That's why there's like a million different brush shapes. All right, I think I just got this last shadow here from the cube. So Oh hey there, Chrissy. Yeah, you did made a live stream. I started I started a little bit early. A little bit before your bedtime. Did you uh Chrissy, did you have a live stream this Wednesday? Cause I've been pretty good. I've been able to catch them the past couple weeks, but I I didn't notice you live streaming this this past Wednesday. I'm trying to think of what I was doing uh, at the time that you would have been live streaming. I'm trying to think. I think I might have been in the kitchen, so I might have missed like the notification or whatever. I was probably. I think I was making food for lunch. Hey there, Dottie. Not too much longer for those uh, landscape those landscape projects, huh, Chrissy? We'll be uh, we'll have to do another live stream like we did for the portraits. Oh, you're live streaming tomorrow, okay. Yeah, I thought I noticed, I thought I noticed a, a scheduled stream uh, for my evening. I think the stream starts at like 2200 my time.
Uh, biggest problem with painting is you don't know a thing about brushes. Well, to be honest with you, you don't really need to know a lot about brushes. Uh, I have my entire life that I like, I've been painting since I was about 14 years old. So nearly two decades. And I've never once concerned myself with the brushes that I use. I simply have only, I, I simply have maintained like the use of a filbert brush, as I described a moment ago. Um, their versatility is unsurpassed by pretty much any other brush. And occasionally I'll use a round brush for like really small details dot size details um and a fan brush i haven't used a fan brush in a long time but occasionally i'll use a fan brush also because they're they're very helpful but you can paint with just about any brush really at the end of the day, you, it's just the way you move it. But I can definitely say that, it, you know, it comes in handy being familiar with this brush in particular. Like, I'm, I've been using a filbert brush for a really, really long time. And so I know the benefits that it has and the way that I can use its shape. And I'd say if you're going to get into painting, probably just grab a, a filbert brush and uh, start, start putting paint on canvas. But definitely don't let brushes intimidate you. They're not, they're, they're not that important. All right, I think that's all my shadows. So I'm done with this color. Let me just clean my brush. Oh, thank you, Chrissy. Yeah, if you enjoy the, the live stream, I do appreciate the thumbs up. But no need to feel obligated. It's 4.30 in the morning. That's dedication. Where is it 4.30 in the morning? I can't think of where that would be. Is that West Coast? That's not West Coast time, is it? I guess, yeah, it would be. So, what, California, Oregon... Washington. I suppose some parts of Mexico, possibly. I'm not. I'm not too too familiar with all the the time zone locations over there. All right, time for next level of shadows. Yes, Callie. Okay. What are you doing up so early or up so late? I guess depending on whether or not you went to sleep.
Oh, Chrissy, I've been meaning to ask you, did you get the, uh, that pastel painting I sent you framed up? Is it, is it hanging up yet? Oh, you're watching Star Wars? Hopefully the old ones, not the new ones. I don't think the new ones are worth staying up for. The new ones were so bad, they'll keep you up. In the wrong way. Another tip, uh, who was it? Um, Yargo, uh, doing lines. So when two colors meet, what you want to, the way you want to approach it is think of the, the second color, the color that you're adding, think of it as pushing into the other color. That's how you get those, the two colors to meet without mixing. Because obviously that's important when you want clean edges between two, two different colors. Yeah, I don't I don't know what they were thinking with the new Star Wars movies. Oh my goodness. You know, I yeah, when I was growing up, I had this friend Derek and we used to play the Star Wars games on Super Nintendo. I can't remember the names of them back back then, but um we loved Star Wars. Um the original ones, not the sequels or prequels the the prequels so the four four five and six technically um i don't even know how many times we watched those we were probably seven eight at the time seven eight nine years old and uh we we love star wars like and when I was a teenager is when the prequels came out and you know I I liked them I enjoyed I enjoyed them enough still didn't feel as connected to them as I did the originals um but they were new Star Wars movies and you know they were they were decent and um you know having new star wars movies come out as an adult i was super excited about it i i was like that's that's fantastic you know bring back some of the original cast cuz i think the problem with this the problem with the prequels is that you just didn't really feel any connection to the characters there based on the originals which is understandable you know it's different time frame but it still just felt a little too disconnected. Um, not to mention all of the CG usage. Um, I think what made the originals so fun to watch is the practical effects. The practical effects were fantastic. Um, and they still hold up after all these years because at the end of the day, they're practical effects and not some, not some beginning stages of computer generated graphics but um uh, the the first the first new one i don't need i guess 
I guess it, uh, what was it the uh, is it the last Jedi? Is that I don't even remember the names of the new ones or something. I don't know. Maybe the last Jedi was the very last one. Can't remember. But um, the ending of that movie was just. It made no sense. Like bringing back Luke Skywalker in that in that way, where he's like full blown midlife crisis. In that scene where he drinks that like blue milk from that weird, creepy creature, like the the whole um, the whole feeling of that movie was just like what? Like it, it was just so bad. Yeah, the the thing with the 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 original Star Wars movies is they actually had stories that you felt involved in. Whereas the new stories the new stories are there's they're I don't even know. They're not even stories, they're just like different events mixed with mixed with modern day political ideology I, I i don't know about you guys but i like to escape the i like to use the the media of entertainment to escape reality not be reminded of it <laughs> you know what i mean They keep they keep doing that with with TV shows and movies nowadays. They just they they need to infect it with with some kind of politics instead of just letting it be fun. Just let it be fun. I'm fine with like social commentary, but not outright political ideology. Oh, hey there, Diane. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I want politics, I'll watch the news. Otherwise, I want to watch a movie and not be reminded of it.
stream didn't freeze, did it? Got kind of uh, quiet in chat. All right, now I'm getting a little concerned. Oh, okay, good. Um, hey there, Rain. No, Udon still has not eaten. I'm starting to get a little nervous, to be honest with you. Tried to feed him again last night. I uh, took a completely different approach. I warmed up his food. I set it outside of his cave. And I left it there the entire night. I didn't bother him. I didn't try to force feed him any, like I didn't try to dangle it in front of his face or anything like that. I just set it outside. And if he happens to wander out and see it and eat it, then great. But I woke up this morning and I checked and he didn't touch it. And so I had to throw it away. Again, that is the fourth time that I've tried to feed him in the past week and a half. And I don't know what's up, but I'm starting to get a little bit concerned. I think uh, probably take him out today and weigh him. I need to weigh him to see what how much he weighs. Because if he, as long as he doesn't lose weight, it's fine. But, um, so I'll weigh him today, and I'll probably weigh him in like a week. And if he loses weight, then I'm going to start worrying a little bit. Because he's, he's still young. He's only six months old. So it's important that he eats, obviously, because he has to grow. Um... When, of course, I mean, when I bought them, um, the breeder didn't mention anything about him having trouble feeding them. So I thought, well, maybe it's just because, you know, he's stressed from the move and he needed time to acclimate to his new surroundings. But I've given him a lot of time uh, and haven't bothered him and I'm constantly checking his the temperature in his enclosure I'm just making sure everything's comfortable and warm and nice and humid so I'm doing everything I can to make him as comfortable as possible I spent most of my morning like quadruple checking the temperatures and everything no, there's nothing else that they eat. They're they're extremely picky. They're extremely picky and finicky with their with eating. So it's it's not something that I'm alarmed by just yet, but it's getting kind of close. Because I haven't seen him move. I haven't seen him move in a while either. I think he's just... They tend to just be very still when they're frightened and stressed. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe I need to... I'd, I'd say I'd take him outside, but it's way too cold for him to get him some sunlight. I ordered... I ordered him uh, a UVB light that will hopefully be here by, like, Monday or something. That way I can give him something to bake under a little bit so he can get some vitamin D 
because reptiles need sun to create vitamin D just like we do. Yeah, I'm going to ask the breeder. Um, I'm, I have a, I'm in a, a group on Reddit. I'm in a subreddit that, um, I've t been talking, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been talking with people in that subreddit for a couple weeks now because just of all, all the, as soon as I couldn't get him to eat the first time, I was already asking questions and getting advice. And so when he didn't take the the first feeder, um, I gave him a week and I just left him alone, didn't do anything with him. And then when he didn't take the second one, I, well, I had to buy more because I, I only got two because I thought he'd eat at least one of them. And so I waited a week and then I tried to feed him yesterday. Uh, he wouldn't do it. So I tried to feed him or I tried to feed him two days ago and then I tried to fight, feed him yesterday as well. And, and just no luck. Just doesn't want anything to do with it. And I couldn't even get him to appear interested in the food I tried to give him yesterday. He was seemingly about as uninterested as as a snake could be in food. He didn't even come out of his cave to sniff it. Which, at the very least, I've gotten him to do twice. At all costs, what I'm trying to avoid is having to force feed him, because force feeding is really stressful for a snake, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want it to have to resort to that. So I'm trying to do everything beforehand. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to be possible for me to source the food from the same place the breeder does. Even though even though I live in the same city as the breeder, um I live in a completely different district. And Katowice is quite large. I've, I don't know where he gets his food either. I don't know. I don't know that it could be so different. Like, if he, I imagine he, he probably orders it offline to get, like, large bulk or something. I don't know how many snakes he cares for. He seems like a relatively small breeder, only selling a handful of snakes at a time. And he, I don't, I don't even actually know for sure he's a breeder. He could, um, he could purchase snakes to to resell. So I, I don't even know if he's Udon's original breeder or whatnot.
there's not a huge selection of of uh, pet stores. There's one I can't even remember the name. It's like Leopard or something weird. Um, so if he if he gets it from them, then I get it from the same from the same place. Yeah, I can't imagine a tiger would you'd have difficulty feeding a tiger. Yeah, royal pythons are just extremely sensitive and finicky with their food. I mean, they're they can be. I, some people just like any other animal, they have different temper, temperaments. They have different personalities, and I see uh, I see people posting their Python in the Reddit, the subreddit that I'm in, and they have like you know seven eight month old little snakes that seem to be quite uh, active and sort of. I guess you could say playful even. Um, but Udon is a absolute bum and never leaves his cave. And when I handle him, he's rather timid and very slow to explore. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get a tiger. But thank you for the warning. <laughs> I, um, my, my grandfather, he had a sanctuary for, for, for big cats. Um, and he didn't have I don't think he had a tiger. I'm pretty sure it was there was no tiger, but he had he had two bears. He had two two brown bears. I think they were brown bears. Um, they were little babies though. They were just uh, cubs, um, probably like less than a year old. Um, and he had. I know for sure he had two big cats. It, this was a long time ago, so I'm trying to remember. I remember going there only once, but I want to say that they were cougars. I think they like mountain lions. I, I'm almost certain, because I for sure they weren't lions. There was there was there's no way they were lions. Um, I just remember they were light light fur. So I think they were cougars.
Uh, anybody in chat um, into video games? Anybody been playing Lost Ark? I started playing. I started playing Lost Ark um, when it came out for Europe uh, last week. You're still playing Stardew Valley? Yeah. Um, yeah, Lost Ark. Lost Ark is free to play. It's on PC. So if you, Diane, if you got Stardew Valley from uh, Steam, I don't know if you're using Steam for your purchases, but uh, you can get Lost Ark through Steam as well, and it's 100% free. It's one of those, um, like you can buy things in the game. That's how they make money. But uh, I just hit level 50 today, and I haven't even remotely considered purchasing anything. And haven't there's no there's no like blocked features or anything that require payment. You can easily get. You can easily put. 2,000 hours in the game and uh, probably not even tell that you haven't uh, needed to pay for anything or even have the desire to. Honestly, I, those, uh, those types of games where they're free but they have like a store that you can buy stuff for real money they that that whole model of gaming i despise first off i just want to say that um but it would not be it would not be able to exist if a majority of players were like me <laughs> that will absolutely take uh full advantage of the freeness and not even once make a purchase Too many loose wallets out there. I miss I miss the good old days where you buy a game and you own it. It makes me think a lot about how I want want the video game that I want to make. How I, how I would manage that. I think. Uh, I think it'd be a one-time purchase with DLC that you also purchase. Oh, okay, you played on the Switch. Oh, hey there, Paulo. Sleep? What do you? What is this? What is sleep even, Chrissy? You don't. You don't sleep. We all know that. You got. You got plenty of video game time. When you have full twenty four hours of the the day, where the rest of us have to actually sleep.
Oh, by the way, Christy, you know, um, what's what has uh, Wendy been up to? I haven't heard from her in a while. She's been really quiet. She must be busy with something, I imagine. She always seemed real busy. Always moving. Yeah, yeah, just buy the game and have it. Yeah, I don't, like, the the model that I would want for my game, for my dream game that I fully intend on pursuing full-time after I, after I retire, um, what's the, uh, there was this game called Borderlands. And you you buy the game, you have the full game. And then instead of making a new game, like Borderlands 2, they just added new, they added essentially a new game to the existing game. And it's always it's always cheaper than the original. So if I were, because 100% I want to make an MMO, like I want to make an MMO ARPG just like Lost Ark, but better. Um, I would essentially just want to continue to build on the same game by adding more content. the way that they do now, but I wouldn't want to do it. I wouldn't want to do it so regularly that it felt like you had a, a subscription to it. You know, I, I, I would probably fail as a games company if I didn't intend on making the game myself because profit would be second Just like, uh, just like my YouTube channel is. Oh, is that what it is, Chrissy? I didn't realize. Yeah, I had no idea that she, she went off social media. I mean, that's both a good and a bad thing. The bad thing is, you know, we don't get to talk to her anymore but the good thing is she's off social media which is probably a positive in her life I mean I've admitted several times throughout the years how you know sometimes I just get so uh, I, I, I get so stressed out from from YouTube and Facebook and all the social media stuff in general that I've I've had the inclination to just just delete everything, including my YouTube channel. Um, it hasn't been like that in a couple years, but gosh, there was there was uh, some time I don't know maybe when I had like fifteen thousand subscribers or maybe twenty thousand subscribers, and I was just like, I just want to delete it all and just go away. Is it, you know, some people really like the attention that they get from social media. They like, they, they somehow attribute the, the number of likes or views to their self worth. And I'm the complete opposite. Like, I don't want anything to do with it. But it, it's turned into my livelihood. And so it's something that I, even though I don't want to care about, sort of, sort of pays my rent, you know. Yeah, I'm. I'm not gonna delete it. Don't worry. <laughs> I won't delete it.
and that's not that's not to imply that I I don't completely appreciate all the time that you guys give me and all the wonderful conversations and stuff like that. It's just uh it's like the culture of it that has always sort of hung 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 me up. Like I I just there's there's just a there's just a culture that exists within it that I don't like to be a part of. I don't like to be associated with. I think that's a better way of doing it. I mean, I think the best the best way to describe it is and YouTube is not so different than than Facebook um, for people that use it constantly, like I do, and uh, other YouTubers that use it constantly. I mean, there's a reason that YouTube is still still considered social media because there is the, the culture of interacting with other YouTubers and whatnot. And um, the, I think Facebook is a little bit easier for people to see the, the culture, the social media culture. And that is when, like, say you have somebody that you know, right? You know them in, in real life, which is like none of you, like many of you I've known for years at this point but we've never met you don't you don't know me in real life even though i act exactly like i am in real life on my youtube channel i don't change at all but uh when you know somebody in real life and you know them on facebook as well and especially if it's a couple like a couple that's dating or married even and you see the the things that they post the pictures and the everything and it's so much more common for everything to be painted in the best light possible to where if you didn't know them in person you would think that they were like the most magnificent couple in the world when in reality you know they're on the brink of like breaking up because you talk to them in person like you know them for real there's just this there's this culture of culture of a facade on social media that even when you don't even when you think it's a negative you you protest you subconsciously participate in it and that just that's a thing that just sort of happens i i, I don't know i think it's well it's just the culture of social media and I think that's the detriment to it. Because the, the people that get caught up in it, they get caught up in that culture of sort of, sort of pretending like everything's perfect. Or they, it's, it's, see, there's, it's like two sides, um, it's like two extremes. Either it's this facade of perfection, which, you know, may be just a cry for help, um, or there is, uh, or is, or it's just this like cesspool of negative, like negativity. You know what I mean? And it's it's really difficult to have a healthy relationship with either of those two sort of to sort of competing cultures. And it just seems to be, it just seems to be sort of snowballing a little bit more um, due to the lockdown situation that we've pretty much all had to deal with the past couple of years where social media is like the primary source of interaction and 
there's not much there's n there's not much positivity in the interaction uh the like the passive interaction unless you're actually talking with somebody directly or whatever like facetiming them or whatever I think that's probably what I've always sort of had an issue with, which kind of makes me, you know, not like to be on social media the way that I am. Because in spite of the fact that I actively avoid these kind of things, it's unavoidable. It's unavoidable when you pretty much exist purely online. And sometimes it gets to me. Yeah, I always try to use it as a way to connect, you know, talk to my friends and family. And I don't really do anything beyond that on Facebook anyway. I have a Twitter account, but that was when I was trying to maximize like my social reach and I thought Twitter was like something that I needed to have for my YouTube channel, but I don't even remember the last time I used it. I check it like maybe once a month just to see if anybody I don't know asked me something. I've had actually a couple people tweet at me questions, so I try to I try to check it like every now and again. But it's very rare that anybody uses it to connect with me. I just sort of have it and it sits there and does nothing. It just seems like it it, it seemed like it was a platform that I could utilize to help grow my channel early on and I thought that it was important because like honestly like every every news thing right every every time I accidentally have to listen to the news which is just another thing I try to avoid as much as possible it's it's always about like what so and so tweeted it's like are, is, is that really news and we, we've just gotten so everything like we know everything at a, a moment's notice down to like the thoughts of any random famous person to the point that their random thought that they posted on twitter is now newsworthy information or or better yet what what they posted 10 years ago is is news like that's uh that's that's why i don't watch the news i don't do any of the the news stuff like i don't want anything to do with it i just want to be i want to live under a rock that's exactly where i want to be i just want to live under a rock in the metaphorical sense I think uh, there was there was some uh, sur not survey um, I can't remember the word uh, but uh, I guess, okay, survey type thing. And it seems like happiness is sort of like on a decline, not for, not for uh, like worldwide or I don't know, maybe possibly worldwide, but um, for like the US. And I usually generally speak in terms of the US since that's where I grew up and stuff. But uh, it seems like as there's more social media, like the happiness just goes down. And it, I, 
I think it's because we we get to see like the world events happen instantly like all over the world like all like the bad stuff all the negative things and because we have such immediate access to it 24 7 we just sort of get drained of our our positive energy and um it's like a vicious circle it's like the more the more you watch stuff that upsets you you keep you keep wanting to watch more of it in hopes that like it gets better maybe but it's just like all the new stuff is just so polarizing and negative no matter what side you're on it's always just combative and abrasive and and negative and i think like when 20 years ago even it was so much less immediate you weren't aware of everything and it just it felt a little bit better i think i think it might be a drawback to knowing so much so quickly <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to have this conversation without being any without I'm trying to have a conversation about politics without being political. <laughs> but more or less I just uh I don't know. Just my thoughts, random thoughts off the top of my head. Oh my goodness, yeah, th that's a good that's a good point. Like the stuff that YouTube recommends it's it's crazy. I like I I would say 95% of what I watch on YouTube is the music that I listen to. It I don't even it's just in the background. I'm not actually watching anything. It's just music playing. That's it. Or or like comedy, like I like to watch comedy bits from just anybody random. Um, so sometimes I'll get recommended good stand-up comedians or something that have a funny bit about something random. Um, because goodness, like, so 95% always music. I would say 2% is like comedy because I need to find something to make me laugh like every day constantly. <laughs> um, and then I'd say 1% is total randomness, but usually art related, whether it's like fixing houses, sculpting. I've been sort of obsessed with like people that go uh, are eBay, eBay resellers. So they go to like thrift stores and stuff and garage sales. Like for some reason, I don't know why that came up, but uh, I've sort of enjoyed it because you, you always you always like learn stuff uh, about random junk that you would see at a garage sale or whatever or thrift store, and then the people that do that are always so wholesome. So if you're if you're looking for some nice wholesomeness uh just just look at garage sailors they tend to be very wholesome Oh yes, I get the the mowing the grass for people. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I've watched. I've probably watched about four hours of a of a guy mowing grass. <laughs> uh, this, I get bored easily.
Yeah, sometimes the recommendations are super strange. I, I sort of feel like the YouTube algorithm knows me a little bit too well at times. Because as as soon as like the strange recommendations come, they they leave and then they come back like on a cycle almost like like YouTube like the algorithm knows like okay he's in the mood for something really off the wall strange like um like some guy mowing grass and then they'll like feed me that for like two days before I finally crack and be like okay why are you why why do you want me to see this guy mowing grass and then I end up watching it <laughs> or or uh, people making tables People making tables, I've gotten a whole plethora of those before. But I have to, I have to admit, um, like I bought a house a few years ago and I would have never bought that house if it weren't for the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> because 100% I came across, um, I came across as a video of this guy saying that he's going to come to America and he's going to buy a house for, for nothing. He's going to buy a house for nothing. And um, I'm like, get out of here. You're not going to buy a house for nothing. And so he comes to Pennsylvania. He goes to Pennsylvania. And he's what, he, what his intentions are is to get a, a zero money down um uh wow i can't remember the name of it uh what is that somebody somebody help me out here um wow, i can't remember the name of the contract a lease option agreement there we go that's it um so he wants he wants to broker a deal where he he gets a lease option agreement with zero money down. And so he's going around to these homeowners and whatnot trying to explain this deal to them. And if you don't know what a lease option agreement is, essentially is, uh, there's some variations, but essentially what he wants is he, he'll tell the owner, look, um, I will take on the burden of paying the mortgage, right? Uh, I will take the burden of paying the mortgage, but you let me lease the house. And so essentially, uh, the idea is to, you you basically own the house without actually owning it. You're, you're, it's leased to you, and then you sublet it to somebody to rent out, right? And they pay you, say they pay you $800 to live there. You pay the owner the mortgage while you get to keep the rest. Um, and that, that's, and then usually a lease option agreement would be like two years or something, two or five years. And at the end, the, the catch is that at the end of the agreement, uh, the seller or the the owner has to offer the house to you at the price that you agree upon so essentially say somebody's selling their house for fifty thousand dollars you go them you go to them and ask for essentially control of the house with a lease lease option agreement zero money down and you say okay so give me this lease option agreement for three years I will take on the, I will take on the taxes. I'll take on the mortgage, um, and, and all of that. And at the end of the two years, or end of the three or five years, or whatever it is, I will pay you seventy thousand dollars. So, you you offer them twenty thousand more than what they're selling it for, but they don't get it for five years or something like that. And then in the meantime, you essentially have autonomy over the house or the property uh, so you can fix it up and then you can rent it out and 
um, make money through those those years, and then at the end of it, you know, you just uh, you just either buy it from them or don't. And whatever money you make in the meantime is just money that you made in the meantime. Oh, thank you so much for the uh, the super chat, Chrissy. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you have a good night. I'll chat with you soon. Anyways, I didn't mean to uh, go on a total tangent about lease option agreements and how they work. I just wanted to give you a quick insight. Well, let me tell you that it's not as easy as it it sounds because a lease option agreement requires a pretty a pretty intricate contract that you probably can't write yourself. And so you'd have to hire a lawyer to do it and that's going to cost you easily a thousand to two thousand dollars. So lease option agreements are far more complex than what he sort of pretends to do in the the video. Either way, it got me interested in real estate that random video, and um, I, I read like six real estate investment books, and about a month later, I bought my first house that I've ever bought. And I rent it out to this day, and uh, <laughs> I'm looking to continue to keep that ball rolling. And I, I really did my homework on the real estate investing because the house that I bought, I bought for $22,000. So dirt cheap in a pretty decent neighborhood, but it needed some work. And so I put um, about $18,000 into it. And that house is now worth probably around 80000 So I've more than doubled my money in the actual value of the property. And I've had a tenant in it for two and a half or two years now, a little over two years. So it's been great. Definitely don't regret it. And I don't think that would have happened. I, I never really thought about real estate investing, like, at all. And so I just happened to come across this, this YouTube video that YouTube recommended randomly. And, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even own my first house if it wasn't for the YouTube algorithm. Kind of funny to think about. Yeah, I'd say it's embarrassing to admit, but honestly, I couldn't care. You can't really embarrass me, so. Yeah, that's that's a crazy good plan right there. Yeah, buy a house in every city. That's that's a super good good idea. I'm I like having I I like the idea of having all my property in the same location, same general location, but that's still really cool. I wouldn't I just wouldn't ha want to deal with like um different state laws and stuff with that I mean that just sounds more complex 
Cause I bought, I, I, I bought my first house and set up management and everything from Poland. So I've only, I've only actually been inside my own house one time. I mean, unless you count like walking in and out, being there more than once. I've only been to my house once. in person. And so you can you can do it remotely pretty pretty well. But I I even doing it remotely, I don't know if I'd want to do it across different states and stuff. Have different management companies dealing with it. I think uh find a good management company then just work with them but that that is that is cool 16k a month would be way more than i would ever need Okie dokie. Time for gradients, I guess. So let's see, we got this and this. And just clean my brush off a little bit. Hey there, Lonnie. All right, I'm gonna zoom in for the gradient on the apple. Just zoom in here. I'm going to do, I'm gonna show you how to do this gradient. Um, I'm gonna do this for my sister Cece because she's also doing these projects and um, she's struggling with her gradients. So I'm gonna break it down so that even she can do it. So I have the number six and the number 10 brush. I'm gonna use the number six to start mixing the gradient. And I'm gonna use the number 10 to smooth it out. So the 10 is fresh, dry, nice and clean, nice and soft. So the first step, this is the, the medium light and this is the extreme dark. So the color in between is the moderate dark. That's the halfway point. So I'm gonna grab, grab some of that and I'm just going to come right across this edge and scribble this paint in. Just scribble it all the way down. I can get a little bit more paint and widen that. Sort of widen it like that. And that's about the, that is about the width of two of these brushes here. And it's an absolute mess, which is fine. I'm gonna remove the paint from this brush that I just did that with. I'm removing the paint, cleaning the brush. And now I'm gonna start from the light side and with the curved side of the brush, I'm going to scoop like a circle. I'm gonna be making like circle motions like this, scooping with that curved bottom half of the brush. It's like a, a subtle tapping scoop. Just mixing that paint. Now I'm 
sweeping it a little bit more. Less of a tap and more of a sweep. Take another paper towel and I'm going to remove the excess paint. Remove the excess paint. Now I'm going to start in sort of the middle and do that same sweep with the paint very gently. And gradually work towards the dark. And I'm going to again remove the excess paint. And I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to bring these colors together. This is with the tapping sweep. Again, remove the excess paint. I think the key part in this process is making sure that you don't have too much paint on the brush itself. Use the paint that's on the canvas. And whatever excess you happen to pull off while mixing, remove it. Right. Now I'm going to grab some of this color here to help me soften that edge. So get a little bit of that paint. And same thing, I'm just going to kind of sweep this paint into the color around the edge here. Again, I'm using just that half of the side there, um, removing, removing the excess paint once again. And I will smooth it. Now you can see how I've tapped it. You can see like the little brush strokes, the little dots. That's when you know you have it right. And you can see the gradient is rather smooth as it comes across. It's just texture because of the brush strokes. Now once you have that, you take your clean number 10, have a clean paper towel ready. So, clean piece of tissue, paper towel. Now again, you want to use the curved part. So that part right there, just the bottom half. And let me see if I can do this. So you're going to brush the canvas with that curved, that curved part of the bottom half of the brush. And because the bristles are longer here, they're a lot softer. So you're going to, like when you touch your finger or whatever, it's, you barely feel it. And that's what you're going to do to your canvas. You're going to start in the light side. And with, without actually, like barely touching the canvas, you're just going to start brushing it. Let me make sure this is in frame. Yeah, 
and you can start to see maybe a little bit of paint. A little bit of paint builds up on the bristles. See it come off? You want to keep this brush as clean as you can. So wipe it on your paper towel often. Hello. Keeping the paint off the brush is how you keep the colors from contaminating. And you just keep sweeping until you get everything nice and smooth, or however you need that gradient to look. But you never add any more paint. There's plenty of paint. Once the canvas is covered, you're never going to uncover it. And there you go. That is how you create soft, smooth gradients. And I could do it more, but I'm not too concerned about it being perfect since this is just a super basic painting in the first place. But I have another gradient to do. I have the extreme light, moderate light, so the um, the moderate light is the or moderate dark extreme light. So the moderate light is the buffer color here. So same thing, I load it up with the moderate light and I scribble it. I'm not afraid to get paint here or plenty of paint. Because the main, the main point of this first buffer color is to remove that first initial line that separates the two colors. Let's remove some of the excess paint. And since this is a cylinder, the gradient is very vertical, so I'll just use vertical lines to help me. 
sort of blend these colors together. Something like that. And I think I'll use some of the extreme light to help with this right here. Rid of the excess paint. For shapes like this, don't be afraid to move your gradient right in there. So look, I'll just see how I messed up that bit. I messed up the shape there. I'm not worried about the shape because I can always paint right over that. I'm focused on the gradient. So I don't care about that little nick that I did in that color. Once again, I'm going to grab the number 10. Um, I'll just fold my paper towel and make sure my bristles are as clean as I can get them without actually washing them because you never want to wet the brush and again i'll just that bottom that bottom half very gently sweep through the the lighter side is the base cube still wet with some kind of extender uh, th well, this is oil paint, so everything is still wet. The hard part is getting rid of streaks. Never used oils before. Here are my favorite medium of all time. They can be a headache for a lot of people, uh, but they are the best looking medium. All right, so this little nick down here, I'm just gonna take my, my color and I'll just fix it. Easy as that. Same thing with the top. 
Just clean up this edge here. And there's my cylinder and my apple with perfectly clean gradients. And now for some reflections. So um, I need to need to do a little bit of color mixing. I need to mix my admixtures, so I'll get this color here. This color. I have my palette taped down so I can't show you me, show you mixing, show you me mixing. Why, why is that phrasing so weird? Show you the mixing. See wherever where else do I have reflections? Um I guess yeah, this color. Plus this. All right, I am done with mixing, so let me just clean my brush a little bit. That should be good. Let's do um, reflection. This color here, and I'll just go. Let's go right here, I guess. I'll just remove the excess paint. The gradient here is a little bit easier since the colors are so close in value. So I'll just wipe off the excess paint. And same technique, I'll use the bottom half of that curve and just gently smooth it out. I 
think that's good. And I'll do um, another one here for the apple, that bottom edge of the apple. So I have this, this color here. So I'm just going to sort of follow the edge of the apple. Same thing, remove the excess paint. I think this is the key step that they miss in the program when creating gradients is that they don't emphasize the importance of a drier brush for the blending part. Because it is significantly easier to do it this way. Alrighty, last thing to do is highlights, and then I can put in the background. So I'll just clean my brush. see the apple highlight sort of here and here and oh that's that's actually the only highlight so I'll leave it at that just remove the excess paint once again Right, I think that is going to do it for that part. Now I just need to fill in the background. So let's get started with that. Hi there, Alex and Rigzen. Anybody have any questions about gradients? I wish my sister was here. She's probably sleeping. But I'll have to... Uh, 
I'll have to message her later and let her know that I made a gradient tutorial just for her. Uh, it goes along with the monthly mastery. It goes along very closely to the monthly mastery, indeed. The same objects that I used for the reference photos for the monthly masteries are two of the same objects that I have here, actually. And as you can see, the process that I am using is exactly what I expect you to do in your monthly masteries. See how clean and sharp my lines are? See the control? See the smoothness of the gradients? Now, in the monthly masteries, currently you, you're not doing reflections or highlights, so I don't expect to see those, but expect to see this level of control, or at least I expect you to attempt this level of control. This is what I want to see in your monthly masteries. You are very welcome for the lesson. And of course, if you have any questions, just ask me.
Oh, that's good. Yeah. It, to get the slowness, uh, there's a there's a phrase in racing that uh, goes smooth or fast is smooth and smooth is fast. And the what it means is the way you take turns in racing. You want your entry and exit to be very smooth and controlled so that you can maintain the maximum amount of speed through the turn. And that's how you win races. And with the smoothness of a clean edge, you have to go very slow and controlled. Sharp edges are made with the utmost control. If you want um if you want a real challenge try going really really s slowly while simultaneously listening to Eskimo Callboy's Pump It song. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now. If there was any song that is difficult to move slowly to, it is this song right here. That's that's true mastery right there. When you can listen to a song like Pump It and and not go super, super fast. Wow, have I already hit the two hour mark? I'm actually kind of surprised how quickly this painting went.
a little pushback. My apologies for my poor conversations. I've never been that good at it. <laughs> That's why I always beg you guys for more questions. I'm going to make this a gradient here anyway, so I'm not too picky about the line. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, Slayer to get over Road Rage. Probably the best way to get rid of, or best way to deal with it instead of actually raging. Man, I I haven't it, that just made me realize how long it's been uh since I've driven a car. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the last time I drove. It has been years. Two thousand eighteen? Was it two thousand eighteen? Nick, that can't be right, was it? I think it actually was two thousand eighteen. Wow. Well, I might be buying a car in the next couple months since I got my license. my Polish license, just to clarify. Uh, do I do a gradient around the shadow or is it always sharp? Uh, it's not always sharp, but in my reference photo, it's sharp. It's not that sharp, like it's not super clean edge sharp like that, but um, the the reality is the 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 shadow, if you think of it in terms of what um, it, this is hard to explain. let me let me find the words. So the Exercise is about either a cast shadow or a form shadow. Form shadows have gradients. That's what creates that roundness. So form, if, if I, hypothetically, if I were to have just a sharp edge, it would look like a flat surface plus a flat surface. And then same here, it'd look like a, a rectangular prism turned sideways with the edge here. So the form shadow is a gradient. Cast shadows are not. Although in reality, they are also depending on the type of light source. Well, really not even what type of light source because no matter how bright the light is, generally the shadow has some sort of reflection or a gradient within it. In my reference photo though, my shadows are relatively sharp they're a little soft around the edges, a little bit soft, but I'm not creating a gradient because they're not form shadows. Uh, with the Evolve program, 
they want you to paint a certain way, so I'm just following their rules for now, keeping it very, very strict and basic. But if I were painting this for myself, um, I would soften those edges. I'd also add texture. You notice my apple is just perfectly smooth. There's no texture. The same thing with my wood blocks. There's no texture. No texture, no detail. That's, that's the rules, and that's what I'm following for now. Until they tell me I can do more. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I tried to emphasize in the monthly masteries is I try to give you a strict rule set like what I'm following here. Work within those rules so that when the time comes you you can expand beyond the rules but in a conscious way. You have a understanding of the foundation, and then you take that foundation, you build on top of it to create something better. And by isolating those, oops, I'm not even in frame, by isolating those steps, you can break them up, you can think of, about them independently. Because you, in order to really replicate something realistically, you need to be able to break it down into its parts. And you just don't have a natural tendency to do that unless you've trained yourself to do it. And that's what I'm trying to teach you with the monthly masteries. That's, that's good to hear, Susan. Yeah, slowing down. Uh, speed comes with time. Speed comes with time. Uh, it's very much like playing an instrument. You know, at, at first, play the, the song or the exercise at half the speed to a metronome so that you make sure that you're playing in time. And then as you commit those movements to muscle memory, you can speed up naturally. And it's the same thing with art. Same thing with everything, really. Yeah, yeah. Naturally, you just speed up with everything that you do. 
I mean, something as basic as doing the dishes, you know, get a good routine and rhythm down and the experience takes over and dishes that used to feel like they took a half hour only take five minutes and just about just about anything In some degree, it's almost unfortunate that we get faster at doing everything that we do repeatedly because the only, the only thing that doesn't benefit from getting better at being faster at is patience. Patience is the only thing that, no matter how good you get, you just can't get, get you just can't get faster at it i think um one of the one of my pet peeves although it's not really a pet peeve i guess it would be more of just uh Something that drives me nuts in a moment, like I almost immediately lose my patience, is if somebody is doing something that I need to do slower than I can do it, that drives me crazy. I'm trying to think of like a real world example, but... It drives me nuts. I have, I actually, I have one, I have one good example. Um, I was at the store once with my dad and it was for, it was for my house. We needed to, uh, we need to fix the plumbing under the sink and what we what we needed to do was go from pvc into um or we needed we needed to switch materials i can't remember exactly what it was like it needed to go from one type of pipe to another type of pipe i can't recall i know it was like pvc into something i think um can't remember the name of it another type of plastic or whatever i don't know some some different connection and that's that's what we needed we needed to go from pvc maybe it was like pvc to metal i don't know for whatever it was we needed to go from one type of connection into another and when we were at the store looking at the plumbing thing to properly connect the sink to the rest of the plumbing uh we found a guy because i was under the impression that we needed to go from this to this i didn't actually know because i didn't look at it i didn't i wasn't i wasn't at the house to identify this problem this was something that was identified and then relayed to me and <laughs> My dad was talking to the guy, the the guy at the store, um, to figure out what we needed and where it was in the store so we could get it and leave. And it, he was just taking way too long to ask for what we needed. <laughs> because all you needed to do was say, we're going from this connection into this connection. How can we do that? And where's the stuff to do it? And 
my dad wanted to give him a life story first. And I just was not, I was like, I was not in the mood for the life story. I was like, this guy doesn't need to know the year my house was built and the family that lived in it. He just needs the, the pertinent information to find what we're looking for. <laughs> and I just, I just, I couldn't do it. I, there, if there's one person in this world that has the absolute on off switch to my patience, it is my dad. Um, he can just turn my patience off with a single flip of a switch faster than anything and anyone else in the known universe. And so when we were in the store and he was, he started giving this guy the life story. I just said, dad, stop talking. <laughs> and, um, yeah, <clears throat> I, I still sort of feel bad about that moment. Uh, cause no, no son should talk to their father that way. Um, but, uh, I just, yeah, just couldn't help it. Oh my goodness. Self checkouts. Oh, those are the worst. Oh yes. The, that's a, I don't even shop at a grocery store in person anymore. And I've always, always, always avoided self checkout like the plague. Um, yeah. Self checkout. That's a perfect example. Those things are super, super annoying because they're so finicky. They're so absolutely finicky. I remember um, when I, I don't know what store it was, but it was, maybe it was like a Walmart or something. I, I don't know. It was in America. But, uh, you know, you, you like swipe the thing, you know, it beep or whatever, and then you put it down in the bagging area where it weighs it. And then it immediately is like, check your bagging area or some nonsense like that. And, it's always just messing around. And then like, it's not working properly and you have to wait for the person to come over and like put in whatever code they need to put in to figure it out. Oh yeah, delegating work is delegating work is another tough one. When you ask somebody to do something and then you you end up you end, you watch them do it just to be annoyed at how slow and not like you they do it. I'll tell you what, my wife cannot delegate work because she does everything in a very, very particular manner. And it took me, it took me like months, no joke. It took me like months, maybe even a full year to, to be able for my wife to tolerate the way I do dishes. Absolutely drove her crazy for like a year straight because, uh, water is, Water is quite expensive here in Poland. And me, you know, I lived on the West Coast most of my adult life. So, you know, that's when I was doing dishes. I definitely weren't doing it as a kid. And because I lived right next to the ocean, there was no limitation on water. I didn't pay for water. It was just, it was just, it comes into my house and... There was, there was no water bill at the house that I lived at or any of the houses that I lived at. So it, when I do dishes, I just fill up the sink with water and scrub the dishes and rinse the dishes and that's it. But the way my wife always did dishes was that you take the biggest pot or bowl or pan or whatever. And instead of filling up the entire sink, you only fill up that pot. 
and you wash all the dishes with the water that's in that pot and you wash all the dishes set them aside and not until all everything's washed do you rinse it um and then when you rinse it you rinse it uh, you rinse it in reverse so that as you're rinsing it the biggest pot or bowl or pan catches the excess water as you're rinsing it and so that you can use that excess water to other, rinse other things and um yeah so it took me took me a while to adjust because i mean when you do when you do something as annoying as doing the dishes because i've never enjoyed doing the dishes it's my least favorite thing to do in the whole wide world um when you do it the same way your entire life and then all of a sudden you have to start changing it you never realized how much the routine of something you despise doing matters and so when my wife had to uh retrain the way that i do dishes it was tough on both of us to say the least but fortunately there's still there's still a little um of my own personal routine in the way that i do dishes that she doesn't like but she tolerates because i do the dishes and she doesn't She does the dishes every now and again, but I'd say I do the dishes like 95%. Um, and I cook 95%. I don't know, do I want to put a gradient there? I think I will. I'm just going to take the same color, maybe a little bit of this. Oh, that's a funny saying, Susan. Yeah. Uh, what does my wife do for work? She works for. Uh, she works for a company that makes electronic cleaning supplies. And she is. Um, she is the backbone of that company. To say the least, because she's the only one that speaks English, and she is essentially the product liaison between all of the surrounding countries for for sales. So, um, she does all like the English communication between people that buy it and the company, and it's a, I mean, it's a small, it's a smaller family run company and uh she enjoys it you know I, my wife is so lucky in the sense that this this might sound mean or this 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 might sound mean but trust me it's not my wife has no ambitions. Um, and I, I confirmed that the other day, like maybe a few weeks ago, because, you know, when you guys get me talking about all kinds of stuff, I talk about all the stuff that I want to do, like making video game. 
and uh, all the projects I want to do, blah, blah, blah. I asked my wife if, like, what she wants. She, she doesn't, I mean, she wants things. Like, that's different than ambition. But she doesn't want to be anything. She just is content. And at first it threw me off because, you know, I love doing stuff. I love learning new things and just trying to become what I dream to be or whatever. I don't even know how to describe it. And if that means like going to school or, you know, studying something or whatever, then that's what I'll do to, to, to be it or to become it. Like those are sort of my goals, my ambitions or whatnot. And my wife is just perfectly content. Like her job to me, her job is just unbearably boring. And I wouldn't want to do anything like that even remotely. And I have a friend also that wants to have a job where he doesn't interact with anybody at all and he just puts things into a computer like that's his dream job to sit in a cubicle by himself interact with nobody and put data into a computer and for me that sounds like the worst torture that i could be subject to and my wife is very similar to that like she is perfectly content and the more i thought about it i was like gosh I, that would be so much better <laughs> than than all the ambition that i that i have to just do a bunch of stuff like i i just want to do a bunch of stuff and that sounds that sounds great usually i think ambition is associated with like positive like in a positive way like it it's sort of seen as being a positive you don't you don't generally think of a person that has zero ambition as being like a good thing for that person but my wife has totally changed my mind on that i think i think having zero ambition as long as you're productive in your life in the sense that you're doing what you do and you're content like that sounds like the dream right there I wish I could just shut my ambition off and be content like my wife. And I just, it never occurred to me that somebody could be like that. Like just be content in that way. Cause I've never experienced it myself. And now that I'm saying it out loud, um, like once I achieve like my next goal, like there's just going to be a goal after that then right? Like, that's what I imagine. I imagine that there's just going to be like this never ending list of goals that I need to work towards. And yeah, I just realized I'm my dad. Yeah. Exactly what my dad does. He's like constantly working, constantly working towards something he has like 9 million projects that every single one of his children knows he'll he'll never complete but he'll still aim for it regardless <laughs> and he'll continue adding more goals but uh yeah i don't even know where this conversation came from or how i got to where i'm at right now in it but uh i think we were talking about doing the dishes and now i'm telling you that my wife has zero ambition <laughs> But I'm kind of a little bit jealous because she's so wonderfully content in her job and in her life that it seems comfortable. I think she could potentially just work at her, her job for the rest of her life and be totally happy with that. All right. 
right, time to smooth out this gradient. Okay, Susan, you take care. Perhaps, maybe it is her calming contentness that subconsciously I'm also attracted to. Yeah, I think it was like a couple weeks ago I was saying how easy it is to be in a relationship with my wife. I think maybe that's the secret, is you just need to find somebody that is content. Find somebody that, that's content, they're already happy, you have no work to do. <laughs> your, your job is done. Find somebody content. That's Good luck with that. My wife is the first person I've ever met content. She is, she is the... She's like a, a a Buddhist monk. Her her contentness makes a Buddhist monk look like a schizophrenic. All right, I think my gradient's done. Just zoom out a little bit. I'll untape this. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Diane. If you can't be happy by yourself, then you can't be happy with somebody. Yeah, when I... Um, when I met my wife, I called her a unicorn because she was like this mythical creature that I couldn't believe existed. Because her, her contentness was just so overwhelming. Alrighty, well this uh, painting is complete. If I can remove this tape here. So I think that's gonna do it for today. Uh, this is just painter's tape. There's nothing special about it. You can get this pretty much from any store imaginable. But there we have it. I'm just going to take a photo of this, I guess. I'm actually surprised I finished that in one sitting. 
I'll probably do another painting next Friday also. Something relatively s similar, but maybe more complex. Some more variety in shape and stuff. But that is going to do it for today. So thank you guys so much for coming by and hanging out. I really appreciate it. Hope you had fun. Hope you learned something. And I will see you on Monday. We'll continue on the Udon project. So I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. And uh, I'll see you Monday. Take care. Peace.